throw the data at it, get an AutoML baseline, and then see if you can do better. Like, and, and maybe you'll be surprised, maybe you can't, right? But like, your job is not to build models, your job is to have a business impact. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Today, I'm talking to Jordan Fisher, who is the CEO and co-founder of Standard AI. Standard AI is an autonomous checkout company that actually has autonomous checkout working. So this is an amazing conversation with someone who has big deep learning models really working in the real world, in real conditions, and it's a very informative conversation. Jordan, it's good to talk to you. It's been a, been a long time. Um, yeah. I thought it might be good to start by saying a little bit about what standard AI is for folks who don't know. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you the quick quick spiel on, on standard. Um, we, we build computer vision powered checkout for, for retail. Probably a lot of people have heard of Amazon Go. So we're sort of go for everyone else is the way we, we think about ourselves. And uh, in particular, we're trying to make it easy to just pick it up and put it into existing stores. So it's this, you know, it's a camera only system. We install it onto the ceilings of existing stores. And then we do all this magic behind the scenes to ultimately figure out what do people have so they can get on with their day and skip the line and get their receipt automatically. And I guess, what's the, uh, what's the founding story? Uh, there's two, two pieces to this piece. One is I just, I despise lines. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I mean, life is short. It's, it's just, I struggle seeing just wasted human capital, right? Like we spend literally billions of hours waiting in line every year. Like it's, it's pretty staggering when you put, when you stack it all up at once and just look at it, like that amount of human capital, just literally incinerated. Um, and we're doing it just for the sake of commerce, right? Like we're, we're just waiting in line, doing nothing. And there's another person on the other side, just waiting for us to get there to then do this transaction. It's the most mind boggling thing. Right. Um, so that just, that sucks and life is short and we shouldn't spend it waiting in line. So I think that's the, that's the obvious piece. <laughs> um, but the, the, the real sort of inception of standard was, was more tech driven. So we had a, we had a really cool tech team that I was, I was working with closely at the SEC uh, and a, a few folks who were sort of in the surrounding industry. And, you know, we just, this was going back six ish years now. And we just saw this revolution happening in ML obviously, but really computer vision at the time, I felt it was having this, this moment where it was just so clear that everything was about to change that you could suddenly reach human parity almost. And in, in some of these tasks and be like, wow, if that's, if that's true, if humans and machines can sort of see equally well, what does that mean for the world? And it should change basically everything, right? Like every industry where, you know, you can put a camera and see stuff should get revolutionized by this coming revolution. Um, that was our like really strong conviction. So we didn't have a particular product in mind. We just sat down and said, okay, we're going <laughs> to, we were actually, we weren't computer vision experts. We were just ML experts. We were building ML for the SEC and uh, we said, okay, well, we're just going to retool. We sat down and for about a year, we just read every computer vision research paper that was coming out. <laughs> wow. And and then we had one business guy, um, really good uh, old, old colleague of mine, um, who was sitting in on the brainstorming sessions and, you know, was just helping us, you know, do the market analysis to TAM and kind of figure out what was what. And we had a bunch of really dumb ideas uh, which I'll tell you about only over a beer sometime. Oh, come on. Tell, <laughs> the, tell me one right now. I want to hear one. <laughs> Actually, so one of them is is starting to become more real in a more niche, in a more like home setting. But I was really passionate about this idea, which was smart gyms and this idea of because we were pretty sold already on like overhead cameras being the modality that we wanted. Uh, and we're like, where can you just put overhead cameras and like, enable a cool experience? Like, well, gyms, right? Just put the cameras up, and then you know you put your your AirPod in your ear. And you should be able to just walk into a gym and your, you know, synthetic personal trainer just starts talking to you. It knows what you've done in the past. It starts counting your reps. You know, it pushes you to like do one more rep or, you know, go for the 15 pound instead of the 12.5 pound. And, you know, it just, it takes all the drudgery out of like doing the self-tracking, which no one wants to do and can yeah. also kind of like push you to, to do more and then, you know, help you with proper form, et cetera. We're starting to see this now in like at, at home gyms where there can be a camera that will like help coach you. Uh, but I don't think we've seen it yet in the, the full gym setting. Um, but then you decided to to do this um, checkout list store idea. I mean, like, was it was it obvious that, that was the best idea? Like, how did how did you come oh, to yeah. it? How did you validate it? <laughs> it was super obvious because <laughs> when you start running the numbers, it's just wild how big the opportunity is, and, and it's only gotten bigger since then. So, like, checkout on its own is is huge, and like I said, it's it's literally billions of hours a year um, across the world. So it's just it's massive. And we spend hundreds of billions of dollars to, to make that happen. 
and there's so much else that needs to happen in the stores, right? So like that, that human capital has an insane number of things that we we need from it in these stores, right? So like stocking the store and customer support and refacing, et cetera. Uh, and we, we hear that now that we're talking to retailers, like they want all these things that, you know, of course they want autonomous checkout because they, they don't want to line either and they want to do the best thing for their shoppers, but they also just can't even staff their stores effectively right now. You know, there are retailers that have 10, 20, thousand plus open positions right now mm -hmm. and you know we go our, our product teams especially go and interview not just the retailers but employees in the store and they get super excited as much as anyone else about autonomous checkout because they're like oh if we have this in my store i get to go do all the things that i want to do right like i get to go interact right. with customers i have my locals that you know my regulars that i really like talking to you know i can i can finally have a spare minute to go fix the out of stocks that are you know are actually hurting the bottom line of the store because, you know, someone walks in and wants their stickers bar and, you know, we haven't had a chance to restock it. Like that's, you know, a massive hit to retail. Uh, so really everyone's super excited about it. And there's all these industries, these retail tech industries can be done better with computer vision powering them, right? So it's it's inventory and out of stock and loss prevention and insights and analytics. And then it's also checkout, right? So it's just like, we started like pulling back all the layers of this onion. We're like, this is really going to just change the entire $25 trillion physical retail industry. Like every every aspect of it gets better once you have the smart system in the store. So we were just like, this is this is insane. So that was that was one of our metrics, obviously. It was like huge TAM. Another one of our metrics was we wanted it to be a really hard tech problem. You know, so like just from like a personal satisfaction place, we we love working on hard tech, but then my my personal preference is working in like super rarefied industries where there's a, a huge barrier to entry from a a technical challenge perspective because it, you know, it rarefies there, right? There's only a handful of teams that are going to be competing with you. So we, it was kind of that sweet spot of like, this is really hard, but it's not quite as hard as like autonomous vehicles where, you know, we're going to be bashing your head against this for, you know, a decade and probably need to go raise a trillion dollars to compete with Waymo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I sort of hit all that, hit the sweet spot of all those things. And so is the challenge to actually see when someone takes something off the shelf, like, is that is that the challenge or is there a point where you sort of show it to a camera and then check out like, how does the experience work? Yeah, for, from the experience perspective, we're really trying to make it just completely seamless. Like you forget that you're doing this, that you're shopping, right? And the, the goal is to make it feel like it's your personal pantry. So just walk in, grab stuff and, you know, put it in your jacket, put it in your pocket, put it in your purse. Uh, you no longer think about transacting. And, you know, we're ho hoping that it sort of does to shopping what Uber and Lyft did to taxis. Like, you're still transacting, but you don't think about that transaction moment anymore. You're just hitting a button, a car shows up, you get in, you get out. And like that, it's just so seamless that now you, you take a lift more than you take a taxi, right? You're, you're growing the pie. And that's that's what we're really hoping to do for retail. And so what do you do on day one when you decide to to make a company that does this? Like what, what was the next step? Did, <laughs> did you go talk to stores and try to get them to install cameras and run ML models or what, how does uh, it work? We did. Yeah, we did actually. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, we, we actually had a pretty big co-founding team, but uh, Michael, who is our, who's our chief business officer was our, you know, the business guy, quote unquote. Right. Um, and me and Michael, we were in New York at the time and we were, we were actually still, we hadn't quit our jobs yet. Um, so we didn't have enough conviction <laughs> but that came shortly thereafter. Um, but yeah, we just walked, walked around uh, Williamsburg and Brooklyn and just started talking to to store owners and it was Saturday. So the very first thing we learned about retail was you don't bother retailers on a Saturday because it's like, that's the most important day of the week for them to sell stuff. So we were just going in talking to store managers and they're like, it's like, what? this sounds cool, I guess, but you need to get out of my store right now. <laughs> like I got, I got stuff to sell. Uh, so, you know, we started coming back on Mondays and Tuesdays and um, yeah, I mean, you go, you go talk to retailers anywhere, even five years ago, six years ago, and it was already clear that everyone wanted this, right? And we were, we were super lucky. You know, once, we, once our name just got out, once we incorporated and put out even just like a little bit of videos about what we were doing, like we just got insane inbound from basically all of the retailers in the world. Like it wasn't, you know, it was small mom and pops, mom and pops all the way up to, you know, mega fortune 10 companies, right? Um, and that was, that was, that's how we knew that, like, if we can build this at the time, it was not clear that we'd succeed, <laughs> but if we could build this, <laughs> then yes, there is this ridiculous, amazing uh, demand at the end of the rainbow. And so where are you at? Like, are, can I, can I go to a standard AI store and, and pull stuff off the shelves? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, I mean, it, it is hard tech, right? So, you know, we're, we're five years in and we haven't deployed everywhere yet, but I, I like to call this space AV light. So you, pro you probably have a lot of AV folks on your store. So I'm always, I'm going to be incessantly pinching them. Everyone in AV should come over to autonomous checkout because um, the time is now, <laughs> but you know, it's, we get to go to market faster. So actually our tech is probably not as advanced yet as AV. I think we're, we're pretty sophisticated. We do some really cool stuff, but we're not, you know, we haven't invested quite as much as the way most of the world. Um, but we get to go to market faster because we can make a mistake. And if so, someone gets ketchup for free. It's like, it's actually an okay experience for someone. And, and retailers are used to it as well. Like they, they have a built-in margin uh, that they expect to lose because it's, there's loss and theft and mistakes and, you know, breakage, et cetera. So it's just a really more friendly place to be. So, you know, we're, we're just now kind of exiting MVP stage. We're, we're, we're at 10 stores now we're, that we've launched in with, with, you know, real retailers, they're just regular stores that we showed up and installed our cameras and transformed them. And uh, one here in the Bay Area, actually at uh, San Jose State University, we just launched uh, about two months ago, which was super awesome because we have more adoption from that one store than our other 10 combined because the students are just like, they love, you know, they're like, yes, <laughs> early adopters, great. So we have like 500 people using our system every single day just at that wow. one store, which is, which is super exciting. So it's, you know, it's still early, but at the same time, you know, we're kind of exiting MVP and, you know, really starting to ramp up with our, our retail clients. Like they, they're finally seeing the tech work in their own stores or their competitor stores. And they're getting really excited about how much shoppers love this. And also all these other value props that we have been, you know, pitching for the last five years around inventory, et cetera. Uh, they're finally seeing it now and, and we're, you know, grow, growing into that and starting to expand. So that's, that's really exciting. And so in those five years that you've been working on it, what is like, has it been, what, what's, what's unlocked the ability to put it into stores? Has it really been like kind of making the models more accurate or something else? It's a whole slew of things for sure, right? Like, you know, it's, there's product work for sure. Cause you know, at the end of the day, it's, there is like real experience and the way that you're presenting it to people in the store matters. Um, there was also just some go to market aspect of it too, right? Where, you know, when we started, we were like, we're just going to put this in every store in the world, which is our intent. Um, but we're like, so let's go sign deals with everyone. Um, and, you know, we were, you know, going out and talking to, you know, mega, you know, like 500,000 square foot stores <laughs> and, you know, like mega grocery stores. And then, you know, we had to kind of take a step back and say, well, look, uh, this is cutting edge tech. We need to start a little bit smaller. We can still partner with big companies and mom and pops, but let's go after convenience stores to start with. You know, it's a smaller, smaller footprint. We don't need as many cameras, et cetera, smaller number of items. So there was a little bit of kind of a reality check there that we should start, start a little bit smaller, which we, you know, we did. So now we're, you know, kind of mastered convenience stores and are going to be expanding from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, for sure, like the engineering, the machine learning, the operations, you know, I think, you know, for me, operations are always a, a super under uh, appreciated aspect of, of ML, right? Like, uh, you just got to go heavy on, on ops and, you know, care a lot about your data, care a lot about your labels and your quality. Um, and that's, you know, that's been super important for us. Interesting. So when you, when you, when you say ops, you mean labeling, that's like the primary ops component. Yeah. Tons of labeling for sure. I mean, we definitely have big data sets and we have a little bit of a hiddle to, as part of our live system, which is another kind of, I, I guess you see hiddle on some AV systems as well, where there can be a disengagement and then you know, a remote pilot will, will take over. Uh -huh. um, but for us, that's actually a much easier part of the process because you don't, you're not driving a car, so you don't need this like 10 millisecond response time. Right. <laughs> we just need to get someone to receipt in the next, you know, five to 10 minutes. So, you know, if we kick off a, a background thread and have a human take a look at something like that's, that's totally fine. And then, you know, that's another label that we can throw back into the system. So it's sort of all self-feeding. When you set up a system in a new store, do you have to train it on the particular inventory in that store? Or I guess even inventory can change over time. Do you kind of keep retraining your systems? Yeah, for sure. I mean, even the stuff that's not, so that the items definitely change, the SKU set and the catalog change, but even the, even the stuff that you would hope would be more generic is not quite as generic as you'd want. So, you know, our, you know, our, our people detection and people tracking systems are in theory, fully generic. Like we show up at a store, we install cameras, we flip a switch and, you know, we basically have a multi-view tracking system that can, you know, fully anonymously track 20, 30, 40 people within a space in real time, which is super, super cool. Um, but nonetheless, it does get better if you fine tune 
on that store. Right. Mm -hmm. So we'll, you know, we'll go in and over the course of that, the first month or two, we'll label a little bit of data, fine tune the model, and then re redeploy to that store. And you do get it, you do get a boost by doing that. I think at some point you probably start seeing diminishing returns. You know, we're only at 10 stores, but presumably at a thousand stores or ten thousand stores, you know, that that human model is going to be so general that there's probably no no point in fine tuning on on a per store environment. But when it comes to products, like you said, like there could be a different product in every single store. Um, that plateaus too. So, you know, to give you kind of a, some rough numbers, a, a C store can have maybe 5,000 unique SKUs in their store, and they're gonna have maybe 30,000 unique SKUs across their fleet, but that fleet might be a thousand stores. So you sort of, you get a, you get a pretty good economy of scales once you start getting to fleet scale, because mm. you're only gonna, to go from one store to the full fleet, you're only gonna six X the size of your catalog, uh, but you're gonna 1,000 X the size of your deployments. So it's, it, it pays off in the long run, but it's super expensive when you're only in 10 stores like we are. <laughs> so we work really hard uh, to stay on top of those ops of, you know, the churn of new SKUs that are showing up. And, you know, it's the the Easter version of the Snickers bar. And uh, <laughs> right. you know, it's just constantly, constantly churning for sure. What do you do in that time when it's like training that month or two where, where people are coming in? Like, is it all sort of human operated at that point? And then it gradually seeds to the ml algorithms or do people have some other mechanism for paying so what's cool is we we run in the background because it's we're showing up at existing stores mm -hmm. we're not building a new store right so the same store is there we're not getting rid of the existing point of sale system the existing checkout system so we install our cameras we're doing our things behind the scene um and then the store is just running as is right so it's it's only when we're ready and you know we sh we show the retailer that we've reached a certain accuracy that we fl flip the switch on and, but then even then once we flip the switch it's not a hard crossover you know so which actually is, is really nice for us because there's still people you know apple pay has like six percent adoption or something right now uh so you're not gonna, you're not going to see an overnight <laughs> you know 10 100 percent adoption of of standard although at, at san jose state we we do see that we're basically at hundred percent adoption at that store, <laughs> but That's awesome. in, in most stores, you, you don't, you're not going to see hundred percent overnight. You're going to see like 5%, right. Um, to start with, and it's going to, you know, it'll take time for everyone to switch over. But what's cool about that is you get the point of sales signal. The point of sales system will tell you what the non-standard shoppers are buying. Our system can still predict what they're trying, what we think they're buying. And then that's actually a nice corrective signal where we can say, well, where are we making mistakes? And then we can, we have a, a, a team that will do deep dive analysis to sort of suss out what happened and then ultimately see if that needs to be a training label back into the, the system. And that's that's a that's a really nice flywheel because that's just running, you know, before and after we launch. Totally, totally. Has your views on um, computer vision architecture changed since 2017? Like I, I feel like computer vision is is constantly making advances does does that affect you have you kind of changed it all the way you've thought about training your models yeah i think we're I and mean, we're still doing a lot of just old-fashioned at this point supervised learning <laughs> and we you know when, when we when we started standard i had this I had a rule when i was and I, at the time i was much more involved with the ml team um and had a rule with the ml team which was you're only allowed to do supervised learning. Like even, even five years ago, there was all this fancy stuff, right? And, you know, auto encoders and, you know, whatever it was, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then it was all, I don't want to say BS, right? It was good research, <laughs> but it was not, it was not uh, production quality, industrial uh, machine learning yet, but it was super attractive. Like people wanted to play around with those things. Uh, but that was my rule. It was like, it has to be just old fashioned supervised learning. We're just going to throw a bunch of, data at this thing. I'm sorry that that's not glamorous. <laughs> um, it's still going to be really hard. I promise you, like you're going to have plenty of chances to solve hard problems. And we did, right. We solved some really cool stuff. Um, but that was kind of the rule back then. And I, I kept that rule for a long time. And I think it's just now getting to a point where I think there's different ways. And of course, supervised is still like the, the mainstay, but uh, you know, I think synthetic data is getting super interesting. And then I think also uh, you know, just in the last eight, six to eight months, this like self-supervised revolution that's happening in, in vision that had already happened in NLP is, you know, super fascinating. So we're starting to play around a little bit. It's not in our production models yet, but we're starting to play around with it a little bit. And um, it's pretty wild what some of the stuff can do. So I actually, I had, I had COVID about a month ago. And so I had a few days where 
I wasn't allowed to take, no one was letting me work, <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> so I was just programming instead. And I, you know, I, I was like, I'm just going to play around with some of the self-supervised stuff. And I just, I took all of our, all of our images from all of our shelves from production, right? With no labels, not, no, no labels whatsoever. Um, but it was, you know, hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of just images of products. Uh, and I trained one of these massive, uh, you know, vision transformer, you know, masked autoencoders. And, and I just let it run while I had COVID because it's about a week to recover. So I just <laughs> let it train the whole time, right? <laughs> and I mean, the, the things that were super striking about this was, first of all, it took me like, you know, four hours to, to do this, right? Like, you know, using, you know, shout out to Hugging Face and all these like, you know, like five years ago, even if I knew what the model architecture should have been five years ago, I would have spent a month programming this thing, right? Totally. <laughs> and here it is like, you know, a couple hours hunting around GitHub, you know, tuning a, a little bit of stuff, you know, I spin up an instance on Google and then I just let this thing run. Wow, you just, you just ran out in one instance? It wasn't even distributed? Wasn't, yeah, I got the biggest instance I could. It was a 16, uh, you know, A100 instance, <laughs> which is something, <laughs> something that only I get to rent. <laughs> I hope no one from our company is listening and is like, oh, I, that means I get to go rent a 16 A100 GPU. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you didn't even need to. I think, you know, the vision transformers are still not as big as the NLP transformers, right? Like you, you don't need the, was it the Palm model from Google where they had two V4 TPU super pods? you know, if you're like 5,000 TPUs or something, right? right. For how, for no, who knows how long, like there's no, there's no vision models that are even close to that big right now, but maybe we should be starting to do that stuff. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, sorry, just to wrap the story and I'm going on super long. <laughs> I, you know, trained this, super, this mask auto coder and it's like basically perfect. It's insane. Like you can mask out 95% of an image that, you know, in the paper, they talk about doing 75% masking. Uh, but there's just such a clear signal from products because it's, you know, CPG products have just such clear packaging, right? Mm. That you can mask out even more of the image and it'll reproduce super faithfully, basically the whole package because it it's able to learn um, what the packaging should look like, right? You know, there's only, there's, you know, if you think about it, we always talk about the manifold hypothesis where it's like, you know, images sit on some submanifold, which is, you know, maybe or maybe not true, but it's definitely true for CPG because, you know, if you have a, if you have a CPG product, there's literally only the manifold is six degrees of freedom, right? You know, it's rotation and translation with a little bit of lighting, but that's it, right? Like it's literally a very low dimensional manifold. Um, and then the model is just able to learn that on its own and it just completely faithfully replicate these. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> For me, it's just wild. <laughs> I've not heard of the manifold hypothesis. Can you can you describe that? It seems like it would be more than six dimensions of, of freedom for... Um, for a packaged item. Well, for, for other stuff, it's way more. So actually, you, and you can see it as it shows up. Sorry, I've been eating snacks here. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so like, so if you, if when you see how well it does on things like chips, it still does really well, but a, a bag of chips has more than six degrees of freedom, right? Cause it's not just rotation and translation in three space, which is six degrees of freedom. It's got all of this, like, you know, sorry for the noise, but <laughs> right. all, all, the, all the crumpling, right? So there's actually a lot more degrees of freedom. Uh, but for something that's rigid, you know, rigid body motion says it's just six degrees of freedom, right? X, X, Y, Z, and then y'all roll, y'all roll pitch. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> and that's it, right? Um, compared to a fixed camera, like there's only six degrees of freedom. If you if you take out the lighting aspect right. of it, which is, you know, uh, add some additional um, degrees of freedom. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's the manifold hypothesis is that, you know, real natural images live on these much smaller, man and, you know, a human has much more manifolds. Uh, dimensions to it, but the CPG's packages are uh, six dimensions. <laughs> so you can learn it pretty quickly, apparently. That's amazing that you're able to spend time uh, training your own model. I'm, I'm jealous. I, uh, I'm jealous too, because it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> um, well, I'm curious. So you guys have been, you know, Weights and Vices customers since the very early days. And yeah, I'm not here to advertise weights and biases, but I would love to know more about your, about your stack. Like, I mean, um, it sounds like you're, you're playing with hugging face. Are you using that in production? Are you using like, you know, what, what else, what other tools are kind of important to you to make the whole system work? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I'm super fascinated by this, this question and like, you know, ML, like the new word ML ops, which I, I don't know when it showed up on the scene, 
but now everyone talks about ML ops and, you know, we have, we have this holy religious war around whether or not is ML. I think it's very similar to the process that DevOps went through where it's like DevOps started as a methodology. Like it was sort of like a practice mm -hmm. and then it very quickly transformed into a, uh, a role, right. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> where it was like, you know, once you can enumerate the things that are in the practice, then you know, certain engineers don't want to do it anymore. So you want a, another engineer <laughs> to do it for you. And you give them that title. You're a DevOps engineer. And like that was, that was against the whole purpose of what DevOps was about. <laughs> but then same with ML ops, right? Like ML ops came, came around and it was like, you know, this is a practice for how ML engineers should be doing their own day-to-day -day ML development. Right. Right. Um, and for me, like, you know, we, we call this end-to-end, -end, um, you know, full cycle machine learning at, at standard, which is how we, we tend to run things. Uh, you know, and it's like, you're, you're responsible for thinking about your business impact, uh, which starts with thinking about the, the metric that you care about, which I'm a big, like, I'm a big, uh, I, don't, I don't know what word I want to use proponent of thinking about metrics. Right. But like, you know, the easiest thing in the world is to like, look at a research paper and be like, oh, so I'm going to use, you know, this mean average precision or whatever. Like that's what all the researchers are doing. Uh, but it's like, no, stop. Like the first thing you need to do is spend a couple of weeks just thinking about your metric. Cause we're we're in production, we have real world use cases. And I guarantee you that the researcher that came up with mean average precision had no real use cases in mind. <laughs> they just came up with it because they needed the number. <laughs> and it is definitely not the thing you want to optimize for, right? So like, you need to, you need to think really hard about what your metric is and validate that that is the right metric. Um, you know, so full, full, for me, full cycle ML is like, think about your business impact, your metric, your data, get hands on with your data, get hands on with labeling, get hands on with model training and get hands-on with deployment, monitoring, you know, and then what we call closing the loop, right? So it's, you know, you need to have those tools that will meet you at the end and say, actually, you, your, your journey has just begun. Uh, let's see how things are failing in production. Let's make sure that we're taking those as, as hard examples to bring back <laughs> to the flock, totally. <laughs> right? Totally. Um, so like, that's, that's super exciting because it's a whole discipline, but it's also exciting because I think, you know, it's still wild west in terms of what does the full stack need to, to look like, right? So weights and biases is super cool. Uh, you know, we, we use, we're on GCP, so we're big Google users. Uh, you know, I think they're innovating a lot in terms of what their, um, what their AI stack looks like. Oh, you, you use their AI stack? What's, what's your favorite stuff? We, I, I've never used any of it. <laughs> I just know we use it. <laughs> but we use Vertex and uh, that's not true actually. I, and I'm, I'm a big believer too. And um, sorry, I say that a lot. Um, Auto ML where it's, <laughs> You know, so I, I, I personally have definitely played around a lot with Google's auto ML. Um, and for me, it's, I think it's another one of those places where it's like, as an ML practitioner, you don't, you don't think to go to auto, auto ML first. You're like, oh no, like auto ML was built for like, you know, like, you know, an old fashioned engineer or like, you know, someone with a business problem, they don't know how to do ML. So Google built this thing to like, make it easier for them to like dip their sheet. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, Take a step back, first of all. <laughs> first of all, I'm sure whoever built AutoML like put a thousand times more resources into this than than you're going to put into your custom ML model. Second of all, even if it's not better, it's a great baseline, right? Totally. So like just just do it. Throw the data at it, get an AutoML baseline, and then see if you can do better. Like, and and maybe you'll be surprised. Maybe you can't, right? But like your job is not to build models. Your job is to have a business impact, right? Um, and if you can do that faster with AutoML or any other tools, like you know, just go for it. Start there. So sorry, I'm, I'm preaching to no, no. We, <laughs> some choir funny. out there. <laughs> we, we had uh, Anthony Goldblum on the podcast and um, you know, the, the CEO and founder of Kaggle. And he was saying that he used Google's AutoML and it got him in the top 10, 10 percentile on, on a Kaggle competition, which I thought was like amazing. It's like, come on guys, like <laughs> yeah, use AutoML. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Just, I mean, that's what these tools are for, right? I mean, like, and I think that's, that's cool actually, because it's, for me, it harkens back to the the previous wild west that we had engineering, right. Where, you know, we used to write assembly code. That's what we all did. Not me personally. Right. But like <laughs> that's the world we did back in the day. Right. And then, you know, we started developing compilers and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, starting, starting to move up the stack and you had the same thing happen back then where people were like, no, 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 no. Like you can't use a compiler. Like you're never going to be able to write assembly the way that I can write assembly. Um, and sure enough, compilers got way better than people. And we kept moving up the stack of abstraction. And I think the same thing is going to happen with, with ML, right? Like we're not going to be sitting here tuning, you know, manually writing layer six goes into layer seven and it's going to go from 128 features to 256 features. You know, like that's, that's not our future. I think as, as MLEs, 
it's it's definitely many levels above that in abstraction. But look, I mean, you're one of the people that has big deep learning models as, as a really core part of your business, and you're successfully deploying a lot of them and continuously um, improving them. So I'm sure people are going to be interested in more specifics around your stack. I mean, could you share kind of like, you know, if you have a point of view on like frameworks, do you use uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> do you use it all? Do, I mean, tell me. Give me, give me, give me the stuff you like and don't like. I think that would be the most <laughs> valuable thing you could offer our audience. Uh, for sure, I I pride myself throughout my career, even pre ML, on like on picking the right horses, the right like uh, stacks that like end up even early, like they end up playing out. All right, so tell me about your 2017 stack then, because I know weights and biases that's <laughs> in there. You're one of our first customers. <laughs> well, for sure the thing. So that was great, but for sure the thing we didn't pick correctly i i i picked tensorflow at the mm. time and you know i think the whole world has revolted against tensorflow um and you know i think that the challenge is you pick the wrong tech and then it gets steeped in your stack right it gets really totally. hard to pull it out so we we've switched over to pytorch since then okay wait let's talk about that because everyone's got a different take on this why do you, why do you think pytorch beat out tensorflow like what what do you think it was i mean for like ease of use is it's the dev experience all, all day, right? Um, I don't necessarily think that it's technically superior. Um, and I think, you know, Google's got a great contender now. Uh, so I've, I've been playing around with Jax in my spare time. And you know, I think we, we don't have anything in production in Jax, but we have a few a few irons in the fire, a few things that uh, we're looking at. And Nice. You're going to get a couple of resumes from our community, I guarantee okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> but, you know, Jax has uh, you know, I think it's got the same great dev experience. The ecosystem is a little bit more nascent, but that's that's to be expected, right? Uh, and I think it's more technically excellent, right? I think it's got way more headroom to to grow. So, and you know, hopefully, it's not going to be as painful of a shift to go from PyTorch to to Jax. We'll see. I think you know, as the deployment stories are maturing too, you know, we're getting to this this place where it doesn't really matter the way you train your model and the, you know the way you're iterating on your experimentation. You know, the way you're going to production can be decoupled from that. Uh, so as long as you as long as you have the weights, then you can, you know, take it to production in a different way potentially. What about uh, like CI/CD production monitoring? Do you use any of the the stuff out there? Is it homegrown? How do you how do you think about that? That is a little little past my. <laughs> I'm not as in the weeds anymore, so I can't nice. can't answer too much of that. Um, I know that we're always. I know we're always complaining about it internally. <laughs> so you nice. probably haven't. I know we haven't settled on the right thing. <laughs> um, I guess the 2017 stack, though. So it's like TensorFlow. Um, what else? Uh, you know, we we definitely built a company on Python to start. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a pragmatic choice because ML is Python. Unfortunately, I I despise Python. You despise uh, <laughs> Python? Wow, that's strong. What? What? You got to come out of the gate strong with these. I love it. These. Yeah, tell me, <laughs> tell me more. What well, do I mean, you like? This, I mean, it's great as an you know, if I'm going to write a 50 line script, it's fantastic, right? If I'm going to write 50,000 line script, script, you know, and it's going to be sitting across 20 engineers, you know, it's a it's a disaster. And what what do you want? What would you prefer? I I, I guess you know it's. I mean, this is the normal religious war, so I'll just I'll just harp on the same <laughs> same points, right? But you know, like for me, I like strong types because I think that they're. Uh, it's not even that you get faster speed, which you do, right? Like that's great, mm -hmm. um, but it's just a it's a con it's a people contract. It's not a machine contract. It's a people contract, and it enforces it. So it's you know I I know when I come to this piece of code, whether I wrote it twenty years ago or what you know someone else wrote it yesterday, I know exactly what the output is, what the input needs to be, and it's just a it's a contract. Um, Whereas with Python, it's you you still have contracts. Like you still still spend a lot of engineering resources coming up with the right, you know, problem decoupling and where should our API boundaries be. Um, but it's never enforced. So, you know, is is the contract that we all agreed upon actually what's happening or isn't it? And you just have to trust or build like a ton of unit tests, right? Um, but but there's no guarantees. So for, for me, strong typing is all about building trust and being able to communicate better with other people. Because for me, engineering, it's a team sport. It's a people sport, totally. actually. It's, 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 it's very much collaborative. And that's, that's why I like strong typing. So favorite typed language is, is what? So, so this, this actually became part of our stack evolution was we, um, we picked Rust 
Actually. Oh, you're going to get a lot of resumes. Okay. I was, <laughs> <laughs> was going to guess that. <laughs> we are definitely hiring plenty of Rust engineers right now. So if you like ML um, and you like productionizing ML and you like Rust and you like streaming a lot of data, you definitely want to come to Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it was, we're still not hundred percent on, on Rust and we have some other stuff in our stack too, but uh, we have a, we have a good healthy amount of, of Rust. Um, and actually one of, one of our early wins was, uh, and this this is why we we ended up choosing Rust was we had one of our founders was a huge Rust uh, proselytizer. So wow, in 2017, yeah, even years even years before that, um, wow. this was Brandon, one of our one of our co-founders, and we were working together for years before that, and he was always pitching me on Rust. He's like, Jordan, let's let's use Rust, and my job was to say no. <laughs> my job <laughs> as an engineering manager <laughs> is to say no. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's a funny story. I, I called the the Streamlit founder, uh, who's also on the podcast, like after he sold his company for like, you know, $800 million. I was like, dude, like, what are you going to do? And he's like, oh, I just want to write more Rust code. I feel like I now can finally, <laughs> can finally do it. So <laughs> just send him your job opening. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, if, if he doesn't have enough money and he just wants to come <laughs> write some Rust code with us. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a cool language, right? Uh, so it took Brandon a while to, because he kept telling me what it was good at and what it wasn't good at. And I was like, okay, well then using what you're telling me, it's not, you, the problem we're working on right now is not what it's for. So like, <laughs> right, you just right. want to work on this because it's cool. Um, but then we finally had this problem where it was like, it was the right thing. So we, we have, this was our multi-view tracking algorithm, which is this like, you know, you, you get, we, do, we run deep learning models per camera to extract these features. And then you have to merge them together across all the different camera feeds in order to build up a single cohesive understanding of how people are moving through the entire store. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not, that part is not deep learning. It's just this like super gnarly sort of graph theory kind of uh, combinatoric optimization problem. And it's dealing with a ton of data, right? Uh, doing a lot of heuristics and it has to be super fast. It has to be soft real time because it's stream processing you know, maybe a hundred cameras each at 30 FPS, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we were building that algorithm and it was just getting wrecked by, and then we were investing so much resource, engineering resources into paralyzing the Python code. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you, that's when you have to take a step back from Python is when you, when you start fighting the GIL, the global interpreter lock, and you're, you're doing all this like funky magic to like get around that. Uh, and you start introducing the worst possible technical debt to, <laughs> to paper over this fundamental limitation of Python, uh, then it's really time to take a step back. So we, we evaluated Rust. We're like, let's see if we can rewrite this whole, and it was a big algorithm. It was like a, you know, this is, you know, ML is awesome because you write like 50 lines of ML and you get magic. This, this algorithm is like, you know, 10,000 lines of gross, nasty, massive heuristics. Um, but we sat down and rewrote it in Rust pretty fast and we got a, a 50X speed up. Wow, uh, we've since since then gotten like an additional two or three x speed up because Rust. The whole like cool thing about Rust is fearless parallelism. I don't know if you know that expression for Rust, right? Like, because it's it's not just strongly typed, uh, it's like hella strongly typed. <laughs> so it has right, has right. this ability to like identify race conditions and make sure that when you're doing parallel programming, you're not going to get you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, so you can actually just you can more confidently move into into multi threading. Um, so we've just gotten huge benefits by moving over Rust from a speed perspective, um, mm -hmm. and from a confidence perspective too, right? Where you know you you have this super complex algorithm, you change something and you want to push it to production. If you had the the thing that we would have had to rewrite it and otherwise would have been like C plus mm plus, -hmm. and it scared the hell out of me because C and C plus plus are just I've, I've I've had to deal with production code in those languages in the past, and you know memory leaks and seg faults and, you know, and you're, you're having ML engineers write these algorithms. They're not necessarily experts at, <laughs> at memory management. Right. <laughs> so, but what's cool is, you know, now we have, you know, more re sort of research oriented people that can make tweaks to this, this multi-view tracking code. And we don't have memory leaks in production. We don't have seg faults in production. You know, they confidently make changes to the algorithm, push it to production and it, it works. Um, so that's, that's super cool. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm definitely a, uh, a Rust proponent. Any other kind of early technical choices that you really feel proud of? Uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, I'll tell you one choice we made that was totally wrong. 
<laughs> which was, um, I, I had this, this belief at the time that, and it wasn't, it ended up being correct, um, but th- it was still the wrong choice. But the belief was that raw, raw camera footage is better than decompressed video. You know, so if you, if you have a camera feed, the best thing you can possibly do is record those pixels raw to disk, train ML models off those raw pixels, um, and then deploy your, your deploy your model, right? Never, never allow H.264, H.265 compression to sit in between, right? Because it's obviously throwing away information. Like that's, that's its job, right? right. You ho- I mean, from a, it's, it's tuned for human fidelity, right? Like, right. so that we can't tell the difference. Um, but I had, I was like fanatical that we had to use raw only. <laughs> so like, we, you know, we, all this engineering work went into just being able to store all this raw data all the time. Um, and it just got way too, just got way too slow to maintain that engineering work. Uh, and we finally ended up doing a, an experiment where we collected a bunch of, of video data and we, we labeled it both from video and from raw. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we trained the models and sure enough, there was like, you know, a pretty sizable gap between how, how much accuracy you could get. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like, it was meaningful. Mm -hmm. Um, but we sat down and we were just like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like, like sure. Like that accuracy matters, but like, we won't have a company if we don't move up the video. (laughs) Right. Um, and you know, I think the scary thing is to this day, we still have a little bit of vestiges of working off of images instead of, instead of video. Cause it's just, you know, you make these decisions early on and like, it's just, it's they're, they're weeds that are so hard to, to pull out. So I'm, st- I'm still, we're all still paying, paying for my sins. <laughs> so that's uh, the, the dangers of making some of those bets, but I think we've made good bets as well in the past. Where do you store all your data and, and how do you retrieve it when you want to train on it? So we, we started off as a on-prem stack. So we were, you know, we, we bought GPUs and we built machines and we put them into convenience stores. <laughs> and it was, you know, that was wild. Um, Cause we had to like upgrade the HVAC in order to make sure the convenience store didn't melt down. Um, <laughs> now we run everything in the cloud. So it's just, we stream everything to the cloud, which is great for iterations. It's, you know, you just have access to, you know, whatever you need. I mean, we have retention policies, et cetera, obviously. Um, but uh, I think, Moving forward, probably in the next year or two, I suspect we'll be taking some of it back on-prem, mostly just from a cost calculus perspective, because the cloud's great, it's super flexible, but it's not necessarily you know, the most economical, especially when you're talking about renting GPUs, which is still an arm and a leg up on the cloud. Do you worry at all that the problem you're solving as, as ML gets better and better might get too easy and would no longer be a deep technical problem? I don't worry about it. I, I know that it's going to happen. So it's, you know, for me, it's a, and we, we talked about this even in early days of standard, right? Where we're like, look, this is, you know, back then we said 10 years from now, it's going to be a, a get clone to do autonomous checkout, right? <laughs> or worst case, like a, you know, a four hour project, right? right. Um, you know, um, an undergrad is going to be doing it over the weekend or something. Right. So we, we knew that was going to happen. And I think we're seeing the progress too, right? Even the story I told you about the, the mass auto encoders, like, you know, that's such a, and like there's real applications to this too, right? It seems like a, uh, you know, like you use that as a pre-training step and it, you know, you get better accuracy on item classification, uh, mm-hmm. better than purely supervised, right? So it's just like this crazy, it's this crazy bump in your ability. And it took us a couple hours to do it now that it's, now that it's just a Git clone. Right. Um, so it's definitely happening. I think we still have a few years left before it's a Git clone. You know, I, I would still guess like four years, maybe four or five years. Just, just four <laughs> years? Wow. Four or five years. Yeah, things are moving fast, man. It's crazy. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> um, but what we told ourselves five years ago was, yes, that's going to happen. Um, but the same is true for any industry, right? Like, you know, a point of sale system is, is you know, I, I like to talk about this a lot too, like, uh, a barcode scanner hooked up to a point of sale system was literally state of the art physics 50 or 60 years ago, right? It's a laser, right? We didn't even know lasers were physically possible. <laughs> and then we, we create, you know, we hypothesized the physics, we validated the physics, we productionized the technology, and now it's so recognized that it's, you know, it's in every single store in the world, right? And you don't even think about it as technology. Um, so yeah, that's, that's going to happen. And I think that 
that's okay. <clears throat> I'm sure we'll have other cool hard problems to solve in 10 years. Um, but what we need to do is transition this tech lead that we have into a sort of a true moat, you know, true flywheel. And I think that's the making ourselves indispensable to retailers, like just providing them so much value that, you know, sure, someone else could come along and get clone autonomous checkout, but, you know, our customer support is amazing. Our product is, is super refined. The experience is amazing. We've got 30 other amazing features that sit on top of the stack that's invaluable to the retailer. The shopper has come to depend on this because, you know, it's standard in their pocket and, you know, they expect people to walk into a store and just have standard work for them. You know, so I think you have to use this tech advantage to turn it into the normal types of advantages that regular startups <laughs> are, are using to, to build a moat. And that's okay. I think that happens to every hard tech company. Or they don't make the, what they set out to make. I think that might be yeah. more common failure mode. Right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Right. What's like, what's like one, um, not obvious, like thing that you could do to like enhance the experience. I'm, I'm sure you've thought about this a lot. Uh, so my big, so there is still this friction in the experience, which is, you know, our, our visual system is fully anonymous. So we don't, we don't know who you are, right? You're person 17 when you walk into the store uh -huh. and that's, that's intentional, right? We don't do facial recognition, et cetera. Uh -huh. um, but we have to tie your payment information to person 17 somehow. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you've been to Amazon Go, they do it with these gates, right? Where you, you know, when you walk up to the store to get in, you have to pass through a gate literally and you use the Amazon app to open the gate. And then there's a, a visual sync basically where behind the scenes, Amazon's saying, okay, you know, Susan just badged in, we see person 17 at the gate. So person 17 must be Susan, right? So you do that, we call, we call it association. And we do something very similar. We don't do it with gates because we believe gates are antithetical to good retail. Like you don't, you don't put friction at the beginning, you put friction at the end. Like a Amazon knows that too. So I don't know why they, <laughs> if they're the best e-commerce player in the world, they know that you put friction at the end. Um, you never put it at the beginning, but sorry, just the tirade. Uh, so we, <laughs> we're strong believers that you don't put gates up. So what we do is we put NFC stickers in the store. Uh, and what you do is same thing, but anytime during your trip, actually, you, you don't need to do it to get into the store. You can just come shop at any time during your trip. You take your phone out, you bump one of these NFC stickers. And then we do the same thing where we know when the bump happens on the back end. And we know that that's Susan. And then we know person 17 was the one bumping because we have this fine grain 3D reconstruction of, of Susan as, as she's at person 17. So we know where their hand is. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do the association, but there's still that friction, right? You have to like take your phone out of your pocket and like think about transacting. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm a, I, I have this belief that we'll be able to get rid of that, you know, at some point in the next couple of years where you can just, you know, without being privacy invasive, you can keep your phone in your pocket and using additional signals like, you know, Bluetooth, et cetera. Um, we should be able to narrow it in and figure out person 17 is, is Susan. Cause then you can really just walk into a store and walk out and never have to think about transacting. Hmm. That's cool. Um, one thing I want to make sure I asked you about is your um, standard SIM data set. Could you maybe describe what that is and why you released a public data set? Yeah, yeah. Um, this was super cool. Um, so it's, you know, it's it's a 3D sim basically of of stores. <laughs> uh, so it builds 3D reconstruction, not 3D reconstructions, but it builds 3D models of stores, totally synthetically, right? Uh, so where are the shelves, where are the cameras, where are the products on the shelves? It tries to simulate, you know, the way that the products are stocked in the shelves. Um, it has a, a decent corpus of of SKUs, etc. So. Uh, it's just a way to like build up these 3D representations of stores. And then obviously what's cool about that is you can generate infinite image data of stores, synthetic stores, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that's a huge leg up to be able to move quickly and get off the ground and you know start, start training. You know, we, we often see a lot of models where if you train on synthetic, it doesn't give you as good results as if you train on, on real data. Uh, that's definitely true still for some of our models, but there are some models where you just can't get the data labels in particular in the real world, right? Um, or you can, but it's just insanely expensive. So like, you know, segmentation is a good example where, you know, it's just so expensive to do segmentation. Um, and for us, actually, we were working on this model called change detection, which is you, you can, if you look at a shelf over time, you can see, <clears throat> you can see the item sort of be taken and removed. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really interesting, so we can create that data set, the real data set, but how do you label it? Like asking a human to 
look at a before and after image and draw a segmentation mask of <laughs> where the item was stayed. It's just like, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, yeah. But with the synthetic data, you can just simulate it and get it a billion images of before and after with perfect segmentation masks. Um, so that was, the, that was the original inspiration for creating that, that data set. Um, and then I think, you know, we're all big proponents of open source and I think open source data is, is sort of the next version of that. You know, if ML is going to revolutionize the world, which it is, um, we have to make that more democratic and the, the code is, is becoming super democratic. The data is, is not right. Um, you know, so I think that's, that's sort of an interesting gap and I'm not, not exactly sure how to fully close that gap. Um, but I think that, you know, open sourcing the synthetic data set at the very least is a, is a cool way to help. Interesting. But, you know, this seems very core to your business. You weren't worried that a competitor might use this, this data set to build a competitive algorithm. Yeah. I mean, you know, my, my opinion is like, there are, there are, there's some great teams working on checkout. Like, you know, obviously I think highly of standard, but yeah, there's, there's a couple of other great teams out there. Um, you know, they're, they're doing this their own way. And it would be sort of like, you know, Cruz using a synthetic generator from Waymo or vice versa, you know, right? Could it happen? Sure, right? Uh, if they do, like, great, and like, you know, you know, best of luck to you. Um, but, you know, I assume they've got their own stuff that they're they're doing and switching costs are so high that, you know, they're so deeply invested in whatever synthetic thing they've got or XYZ that they're doing, like, it's just going to be too expensive for them to switch. So I think really the value of these open source initiatives is is for the broader community so that people can get their hands on this play around with it and you know come up with some other really cool application and show us what's possible right like we're we're so tunnel focused on tunnel visioned on 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 trying to build this one thing that we're trying to get out um maybe there's some other cool stuff that you can do with this have you seen any interesting applications yet not not yet but hopefully Hopefully someone who wants to come do Rust machine learning will <laughs> get cloned. Don't forget about Jax. <laughs> Jax, yeah. <laughs> get cloned, do something cool with it, and then- And weights and biases, don't forget. Yes, um, yes exactly. <laughs> uh, do, do you have any kind of like benchmark for accuracy on this data set? Do you, do you think about it like that at all? Uh, we do, yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be similar. To, I don't know exactly what it what it is, um, but we can follow up with with the folks that that built that data set, but it's it's something more similar like intersection over union, right? Like it's mm-hmm. you know, how how close are you getting that that segmentation mass basically to the ground truth? Right, right. All right. Well, we always end with two questions that I want to make sure I ask you. Um, so one question is, um, what's an underrated topic anywhere in ML that you know if you had extra time you'd love to look into or study? Uh, we touched on a lot of them. I guess some of them are underrated, right? But like, you know, I'm, I'm a huge believer in tooling. You got to pick the right tools and you got to keep pushing, pushing the tools forward. Uh, huge believer in ops, you know, whether it's ladling or having some human loop component, like you've got to invest in world-class ops. And I think that's, that's, th- those are the unsung heroes in the world. Everyone, everyone wants to be an MLE, but you know, the, the operators are, uh, are amazing folks who really make this possible. Um, in terms of more like, researchy in the ml world you know maybe this isn't a a hot take but you know i'm still a big believer in symbolic reasoning (laughs) wow it's uh it's i I, and i think you know maybe i'm just like one of those old foggies that is going to die on the hill but uh it's just so clear to me that the way our brains work is partially symbolic right not fully right obviously we have like you know, you get some stroke of intuition, et cetera, the way we do item classification, it's like, who knows? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's literally a deep network of real neurons. But it's so clear that when I'm introspecting the way that my brain works for something slightly higher and more abstract, that it's doing something more symbolic and is really kind of thinking through the, the sort of graph structure of the problem and breaking it down, exploring different, you know, aspects of the tree. Um, and I, I think re- there's got to be some way to merge it, merge it together. And so if I... If I had just made $800 million, <laughs> I would be using Rust to solve how to bring symbolic logic and mega transformer models together to, you know, to uh, rule the world and, you know, solve world hunger. Well, I kind of hope there's an exit in your future. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the last question is, what's the hardest part about making machine learning work. And in your case, maybe I would say what's been the most surprisingly difficult 
part of kind of going from these image models to a working system in in production that people can actually use to to purchase stuff i mean so many things but the world is the world is messy it's super messy right and and in this case i literally mean messy right because like stores are stores are chaotic places right like there's thousands and thousands of items and most of them aren't in the place that the retailer wants them to be um, they have they have these meticulous plans that they invest in called planograms where they optimize where all the products should go and the CPGs are investing too because they're trying to sell you more Snickers. I don't know why I keep using Snickers, but um, <laughs> but you know it's like they have this plan, but then show up at a C store, show up at a grocery store, and stuff's everywhere, right? And there's there's people unpacking boxes, and misplaced items, and there's just random stuff on the floor, and you know, and they they try really hard to keep the store clean, obviously, but it's just a pretty chaotic place retail is is chaotic right you've got thousands of people coming through the store every day like it's going to get messy right um that's challenging right like it's a really dynamic visual data set and just random stuff happens right like in the av world they talk about the long tail distribution of reality but like yeah we we see that right like all right give give me give me some long tail cases i love these (laughs) so we had a one of one of our stores we had a a listeria outbreak and Yeah. Um, so they had to throw away all the fresh foods. Uh, and then they had, so in, in retail, they call it selling air. So you can't sell air. So they had to put something on the shelves, but they didn't have any fresh foods. So that store manager and store managers are typically super empowered in retail, right? Like, you know, there's these massive companies, but store managers actually get, get to have a lot of say because they're the ones that are trying to sell stuff. Right. And they know the local clientele, et cetera. So that's that local store manager was like, well, I'm just going to go get, fresh food. <laughs> like I need sandwiches. Like I'm going to go get sandwiches. So they went and got new sandwiches same day, brought them back, stocked their shelves. Right. Um, and now suddenly from a computer vision perspective, you're like, well, we've never seen these products before. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> we don't know what the barcodes are. Right. Uh, we have no data set for this. Right. But the store manager is like, I need to turn around and start selling this stuff right now. Right. So, you know, we, we were able to turn that around and start selling it pretty quickly. Wow. Um, but that's, you know, that's super hard, right? And that's, you know, again, it's it's this really rich intersection of engineering, ML and operations and, and client support too, right? Like it's, you know, you have to bring all those things together. This is not just ML. Um, and I think that's that's a lesson that we've learned over and over again is, you know, every piece of this has some connection to the shopper, to the retailer, um, to us as a business. And you have to bring all the stakeholders together. Like we're, we're a super cross-functional team uh, and we love, you know, coming together and looking at all the different sides of the problem to ultimately make something that we can put out into the real world. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time, Jordan. That was super fun. Super fun. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks Thanks for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out.